Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you because thus far you have helped us. You have been speaking to us since the beginning of the Congress, and you have used every servant of yours, every minister, preaching from this place, and handling seminars and the various things we have done to speak out, touch our hearts, and reach us at the point where we are. We know it is because of your love. And we pray, Lord, that we will have the right response to the love you have shown us in Jesus' name. That all that we're hearing, the encouragement, the teaching, the rebuke, the correction, everything you have brought across our way will be useful, profitable in every life to prepare us for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. We pray that none of us will go through this Congress and still remain the same as we came. Purge everyone, cleanse everyone, prepare everyone for your coming, that Lord, on the last day, we will be grateful to you that we attended such a meeting like this. Again, as we come to this prayer session, teaching on prayer, we pray, O Lord, that you will anoint our eyes and ears to see and to hear what you want us to know and understand. We believe you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Our session this morning on Christ's prayer model brings us to the last in the series. Already you will remember we have dealt with what is generally referred to as the Lord's Prayer from different perspectives. We have seen the pattern of prayer. We have seen the priority of prayer. We have seen petitions in prayer. And today we come to preservation through prayer. Just to refresh your memory, on a few general things I have said on this prayer, we want to read the passage again and remind ourselves of things that are very necessary if we're going to pray this prayer aright, and if we're going to pray any other kind of prayer aright. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen i pointed to you on the first day that to pray this prayer aright, we need to notice the relationship that we maintain with the Lord. Our Father, which art in heaven, I told you that is a father-child relationship. Hallowed be thy name, deity, worshiper, relationship. Thy kingdom come is the sovereign subject relationship that will be done in earth as it is in heaven is the master-servant relationship. Give us this day our daily bread is the benefactor-beneficiary relationship. Forgive us our debts as we do forgive those that trespass against us or we forgive our debtors. Savior, sinner, relationship. Lead us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
is a pilgrim guide or the guide pilgrim relationship. Which means then, to pray this prayer, or to pray any other kind of prayer, that heaven will notice, that God the Father will respond to. You need to recheck up your own relationship with the Lord. Do you behave to him live as a child? Do you worship him in spirit and in truth? Are you a subject of the kingdom, completely submissive to the plan and the program of the kingdom? Are you a servant doing the will of God from the heart? Do you rely upon him, believing that all benefits in your life will come from him? Have you known that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom you are chief? Have you seen yourself as a pilgrim on your way to heaven, and therefore you are telling the Lord, I cannot lead myself or guide myself. If I guide myself, I will every time fall into temptation. I will get myself into trouble. Therefore, Lord, I'm praying to you as my guide that you will lead me but not into temptation. You will deliver me from evil. I also told you that apart from the relationship or beyond the relationship, we need the right attitude or the right spirit. Our meaning that we pray with an unselfish spirit. Father, we pray with a family spirit. Hallowed be thy name. We pray with a reverent spirit. Thy kingdom come, a loyal spirit. Thy will be done, a submissive spirit. Give us this day our daily bread, a dependent spirit. Forgive us our debts, a penitent, repentant spirit. Lead us not into temptation. It's a humble spirit. Thine is the kingdom. Confident spirit. And the power. Triumphant spirit. And the glory forever. An exultant spirit. Which means then, we maintain a right relationship with the Lord. And we also keep a right attitude. A right spirit. Before the Lord in prayer. Then I told you that same first day that this prayer focuses entirely and completely on God. Our Father which art in heaven, I reminded you, is God's paternity. Hallowed be thy name is God's priority. And thy kingdom come is God's program. Thy will be done in earth as it is done in heaven is God's purpose and plan. Give us this day our daily bread is God's provision. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors is God's pardon. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil is God's protection. And now the climax of the prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, God's preeminence. You remember? That when everything has come under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Lord Jesus Christ as King and as Lord, he'll hand over everything unto the Father, that the Father, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, may be all in all, the preeminence of God. I then told you in our third session that if you look at this prayer, you can break the prayer into two parts. That is, if you look at the requests that are made in the prayer, you have the first three elements talking about God and his glory. And you have the last set of three elements talking about man and his need. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Three things relating to God and his glory. Give us bread, forgive us our debts, lead us, relating to man and his need. And I told you that those three elements relating to God show him as a father whose name we honor, as a king under whose kingdom we live. And also it refers to him as a master whose will must be done. Talking about the need of man, bread, 
forgiveness, guidance, leading us not into temptation, but delivering us from evil. I told you that we can match the first three relating to God with the next three relating to man. That as a father, he gives us bread. Do you remember? It's not try to give the children's bread and give unto dogs that is within the family. The father will give us bread. Ask, can it shall be given you? And seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Then he says, for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now he tells us what happens in the family, or what man is there of you. If his son shall ask bread. So then he gives us bread as father, as the king of kings, and the lord of lords, who has the right to throw all the sinners who owe him debts, throw them into the prison because they have nothing to pay. He has the right. He could do it. But because the servant bent down and bent low and said, Lord, have mercy upon me, then the king in the parable freely forgave. And so in this prayer, as a king, he forgives our debts. But then, as a master, he commands us what we are to do. And he says, this is what to do, that's it what to do. And then we do his will because he is master. Then I told you that to pray this prayer, we really need to check up our lives. Because I cannot say our if I live only for myself in a spiritually watertight compartment, neither can I say, Father, if I do not endeavor every day in everything to act like a child of God, can I say, who art in heaven? If I never think about heaven, if I don't have any treasure in heaven, if I am not laying up my treasure in heaven, can I say, hallowed be thy name, if I am blaspheming that name, if I'm dishonoring that name, if the name of the Lord is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of me, can I then sincerely pray, hallowed be thy name? No. I must be daily striving to honor him and honor him alone and to live in holiness of life. If I'm going to be able to sincerely say, hallowed be thy name, I cannot say, thy kingdom come. If I am not doing all in my power and strength to hasten the coming of the kingdom, I cannot say thy will be done. If I am disobedient to his word, I cannot say in earth as it is in heaven. If I am not serving him here and now, and I cannot say give us this day a daily bread. If I am seeking to meet my needs dishonestly, if I'm fraudulent, if I steal, if I'm cunningly uh, mischievous, I cannot say, O oh Lord, in my craft or craftiness, give me all that I need. Before I can say, give us this day a daily bread, I must be working honestly. I cannot say, forgive us our debts, if I have a grudge against anyone. A grudge against my wife, a grudge against your husband, a grudge against your children, a grudge against your parents, a grudge against your pastor, or a grudge against the members of your church. You cannot sincerely say that God shall forgive you as to forgive others when you are not sincerely and fully and wholeheartedly forgiving other people. Can you say as we forgive others that trespass against us, or as we forgive our debtors, if you do not forget injuries that are caused by offenders, I cannot say, lead us not into temptation. If I deliberately place myself in the path of temptation, I cannot say, deliver us from evil if I do not put on the whole armor of God so that I can stand and withstand in the evil day. I cannot say, thine is the kingdom. 
if I do not give the king the honor and the loyalty and the obedience that is due to him as a faithful subject, I cannot say, and the power. If I constantly fear any other power here on earth, I cannot say, and the glory, if I am seeking to honor myself, or seek to honor my wife, or seek to honor my husband, or seek to exalt anyone on earth above the Lord, and I make anyone first in my life, how can I say that his is the glory? Neither can I say forever. If the rising of my life is bound completely by time, neither can I say amen. If I have any iota of doubt in my mind concerning any part of the word of God. To say amen is to say God said it, that settles it, and so it will be. Amen, so let it be. And so you see that as you look at this prayer, the prayer is like a skeleton of all prayers. And then every other word you speak in prayer is like flesh you are adding to the skeleton. Its ingredients touch every area of need and every element of glorifying God. It is a comprehensive masterpiece of, of all that is necessary in prayer and of all that is part of true prayer. Jesus pre presented this prayer in bold contrast to the substandard, inadequate, hypocritical praying that was common in his time. He demonstrated that there must be, there must be a death of self. If prayer is to be in its purest form, the prayer we pray selfishly without the death the crucifixion, the destruction of self is not prayer in its purest form. But when self is crucified, when self is dealt a deadly blow, and self is taken out of the way, only then can we go to God in prayer and pray in its, pray in its purest form. This then is a prayer which in every face and in every petition focuses on the Lord. It focuses on his person. It focuses on his attributes. It focuses on his wonderful works. Prayer, this prayer, is God-centered, not self-centered. This prayer is heart-centered, not mouth-centered. Until we know the truth about God, we do not really know how we can pray to him. Inadequate theology makes prayer substandard. If we are not all right in your doctrinal understanding of the word of God, of the attributes of God, of the characteristics of God, of the promises of God, of the covenant of God, if you have inadequate theology, it makes your prayer to be unscriptural and substandard. You see, there are some people that say they don't care reading the word of God. The God has called them to a ministry of praying, praying, praying. That prayer is going to be unscriptural. It's going to be substandard because it is going to be based on ignorance. It is when you know the word of God that you can pray and write to pray properly then. We must allow the scripture to form our knowledge of God. The more we know about God, the more meaningful our prayer life will become. Look at this side now of the prayer. Every petition in this prayer relates to something that God has already guaranteed in his word. You look at this prayer, and you see that everything God promises or the Lord teaches us and directs us to pray for in this prayer, everything has been guaranteed in Scripture. Think about it. Hallowed be thy name. God's name will be hallowed. 
because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Sooner or later, that will be done by the whole creation. When it says, thy kingdom come, it will come. That's the uniform testimony of all the prophets of the Old Testament and of Jesus Christ and of John the Baptist and of all the apostles. The kingdom will definitely come. In fact, Revelation tells us to rejoice because the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is the kingdom coming? Oh yes, it will come. When it says, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven at the time of the millennium. Everyone, everywhere, they will do the will of the Father. For the Lord shall come out of Jerusalem, out of Zion, and it will go all over the earth. And the knowledge of the will of God shall cover the earth as the seas cover the ocean. It will be done when it says, And give us this day our daily bread. It's according to the promise of God. Already as promised us in the Old Testament, it says he will feed us if we're hungry. He will preserve your life in famine. And so when he also says, forgive us our debts. Already you know the promise of God, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal the land and I will forgive their sins. Already has given us that promise. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What has he told us? He that abideth in the secret place of the Most High. He shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And then he tells us, as you go down in Psalm 91, he will not allow any evil to come to you. You will see with your eyes, so little be old, but it will not come near you because he has put his trust in me. You know what I'm telling you? Every item in this place, Prayer is what has been promised and guaranteed already. Which tells us another thing. If you are going to pray, all right, you must check up the word of God. Check up the promises of God. And then when you are praying, you know, all your prayer should just be what we have in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, reading from verse 25. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. That's praying. When you look at the word of God, and when you can go back to God and say, this is the promise you gave me in the word, this is what you guaranteed in the word, this is what you said ultimately will come in the word. This is the expression of your will in the word. And say, God, the word which thou hast spoken concerning thy servant or concerning a house, anyone you are praying about, establish it. That's all you are praying for. You are not asking that God should do something which he has not promised. You are not badgering God. You are not conning God. You are not forcing God to do something he doesn't want to do. You look at the promises of God. There are thousands of them in the Bible. And you just go back to God and you say, God, exactly what you have, have said you will do, do according to your word. And so it is very important that we realize that if we pray like that, God answers prayer. And so if you come, with an attitude and condition of sonship, of reverence, of submission, of obedience, of faith, of forgiveness, will you forgive other people, then your prayers will be answered. Don't we know that God answers prayer? Oh yes, God answers prayer. Abraham prayed and Lot was delivered from burning Sodom. Abraham's servant prayed and Rebekah appeared. Jacob prayed, wrestled in prayer, and Esau's mind was turned from 20 years of revenge. Moses prayed, and Israel was spared from rejection and destruction. Joshua prayed, and Achan was discovered, victory was won. Anna prayed, and then a prophet was born to direct the destiny of a nation. David prayed, and Ahithophel's counsel was brought to nothing. 
Jehoshaphat prayed and God turned away his enemies. Daniel prayed and the lions were muzzled. Nehemiah prayed and in a moment the king's heart was softened. Elijah prayed and there was a drought for three and a half years. He prayed again and the rain came. Elisha prayed and a child was raised from the dead. The 120 prayed in the upper room and the Holy Ghost was given and sinners were saved. And the apostles prayed and the sick were healed. Believers prayed and Peter was released from jail. God answers prayer. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, this is the uniform testimony we have that the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you pray, God will answer. As we come to the last session today, let's just go through three points. Number one, prayer of escape from temptation. Prayer of escape from temptation. Number two, protection from evil. Protection from evil. Number three, preeminence of God. Preeminence of God. As we look at Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Here we see that temptation is something very real. Jesus Christ himself was tempted. And he told his own disciples, exhorted them and warned them that they had to watch and pray lest they will fall into temptation. Although Peter appeared overconfident, self-confident, thinking that he was a match for every situation, but the Lord still told him to watch and pray in Matthew chapter 26. Verse 41, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This tells us that even when you are a believer, you may have a good desire. You want to serve the Lord. You want to trust the Lord. You want to move on with the Lord until the very end of the journey. But then there may be a weak flesh that is pulling you back and a peculiarity within you that is restraining how fast you want to run in the kingdom of God. But the Lord said that weakness of the flesh can be overcome if you are serious about it. If you know that there are times when your spirit wants to fly. When your soul wants to cleave unto the Lord, but then the flesh or some peculiarities that you may not be able to tell another individual, although you do not really go into sin, but it is bringing temptation, it is bringing suggestion, it is bringing discouragement, it is trying to pull you down. And the Lord said the way you can overcome that is to watch and to pray. To make sure that to watch, you are vigilant over yourself. That particular area. Don't you see what the farmers do when they plant a tender, far, a, a tender plant? Then they'll make a fence around it. And they are watching that thing and watching that thing all the time. You understand too that to watch that area of your life. And you do not expose yourself to temptation because temptation might be so strong in that area that even your spirit that is willing to serve God may not be in control of your flesh when that thing comes in his fury. Therefore, it says, watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Although your spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. But we thank God that although there are temptations, God moderates those temptations. He does not allow temptation greater than you can overcome to come upon you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And in verse 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. 
Whatever the temptation is, to you it may look peculiar. It may look special. It may look fiery or fiery. Or it may look so strange. Or it may seem as if as this ever happened to any other person. It says there's no temptation taking you than is common. But such as is common to man. You see, the Corinthians, they were in a peculiar situation. Corinth was a very bad place, a corrupted, polluted, idolatrous place. And there were a lot of evil things, immoral things that could bring temptation to those Corinthians. And yet, Paul the Apostle said, don't think it will be better if you are in Jerusalem. Don't think it will be better if you are in Antioch. That even in, Cor in Corinth here, as bad, as evil, as polluted, as corrupted as it is, as tempting, as the activities of the land, the activities of Corinth are. Do you know that with all you see in Corinth, there has no temptation taken you? But such as is common to man. But God is faithful. God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted above ye that ye are able? But he will with every temptation. With the temptation, he will also make a way that ye may be able to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And so we know that the Lord is able to support his own. If we will pray, if we will trust in the Lord, in Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, the Lord had given a general warning to everyone, but he focused on Peter in particular. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Why? For what purpose? I want you to take your mind now back to primary school. If it so happens that a child in the primary school is the pet of the teacher, and the teacher likes him so much, and any time the teacher is asking a question, that child is the first to raise up the hand, and any time the uh, teacher wants to give any assignment, is that child is the first child that the teacher is going to say, you must do this. Any time that the teacher wants to mark papers, if he doesn't have time to look over the papers of the others, that child is the one that uh, the teacher is going to say, where is your paper? Did you do that assignment? All eyes will be on that child. And all the other pupils, all the other children, they'll be trying to find fault. And they want to bring that uh, boy down or that girl down just to prove that although the teacher is concentrating on you, you are not better than we are. You know the devil? The devil recognized this Peter. This Peter. He was the one that made the spectacular confession. When Jesus said, who do men say I am? And he didn't allow other people to talk. He came out first. And then Jesus said, Simon, it's not you flesh and blood that has revealed that unto you. My father who is in heaven. And he said, thou art Peter. And then he says, upon this rock I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against that church. Therefore, if the church is going to be built, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, that Peter is going to have a conspicuous place. Satan was after him. And Jesus was walking on the water. And the others were in the boat. And then they, all the disciples were afraid. And they cried out. They said, it's a spirit. And Jesus said, be not afraid. It's me. Ah, it's you. And we have our man again. And here Peter said, Lord, if that is you, so that I can do what you do, there will be no difference between you and I, so that I will know that all you that believe in me, the works I do ye shall do. And greater works than this shall ye do, because I go to the Father, bid me come unto thee. And Jesus said, come. Before that word came out, Peter jumped out of the boat. He was on the water. 
And then, when the devil saw that, he made the storm to increase. When he was sinking, he said, Lord, help me. Before he finished saying, Lord, help me, that man was a favorite of Christ. He, he picked him up like this. He put him on the water again and said, try again, you can do it. And that man walked and went into the boat. And Satan said, if I don't get that man, I'm not going to succeed. They left all the others alone and then he targeted him. Targeted him. You want to work for God? You are praying for greater faith. You are praying for greater anointing. You want to demolish and destroy the works of the devil. You want to go and build church and make the church, the kingdom of God strong in your locality, in your region, wherever you come from. Oh, that's a good decision. But there's something there. And then when Jesus Christ was telling them, one of you, you are going to betray me. You are going to betray me. What? Anyone going to betray the Lord? Is it I? Is it I? And you know Peter, he said, Lord, all these people, James, John, Matthew, all the others, though they deny you, you can count on me. He meant it. He meant it. That's consecration. And you remember when they came to take the Lord, the Lord had asked them before, he said, he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. And he said, here are two. He said, it's enough. And so Peter got one of those two swords and put it there. Let me see the one that will come for my Lord. He loved the Lord. He wanted to serve the Lord. And here were the people. And they were coming. And as they were coming, here he saw Judas Iscariot. Ah, so that's what Jesus said, one of you will betray me. And as they came like this, wanting to take the Lord, he threw out the sword and he wanted to cut the head, but he got the ear. And then Jesus said, put it back. That's why Satan was after that man. He loved the Lord. He wanted to serve the Lord. It's just like you. It's like you when you say, give me the whole nation. As if, if no other worker is serious, if nobody wants to do anything. Why? Look at the way the pastor is preaching. As if, uh, you know, the other people, they are not serious. If there is no money, if there is no food, I will go. I will do it. When we come next time, I don't want the pastor to be preaching like this. As if every one of us, nobody wants to do anything, I will do it. If there is no money, if there is no food, if there is no wife, if there is no child, if there is nothing, I alone, and I know that God can use me, and God will use you. But you know, when you begin to do like that, then the devil sees there's another Simon there. Simon? Simon? The devil wants to have you. Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, and take away all the confidence, all the faith, all the consecration, all the commitment, and take it away from you. But then look at verse 32. But I have prayed for thee. The Lord is praying for you. You know, he's at the right hand of the Father, and he's praying for every one of us. He will keep you steady. He will hold you steady. Although the devil will try, by the grace of God, he will not catch you in Jesus' name. He said, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, when thou art converted, what? He was already converted. He was already born again. He had already preached repentance to others. He had already gone out to even minister to the sick and they had been healed. And the demon possessed had been delivered. But Jesus said, Peter, do you know that you are going to go so low? Things are going to be bad. But sliding is coming. You will deny me completely, but you'll be converted again. When you are converted, strengthen thy brethren. Well, we're talking about what has happened already. And in your own life, we're talking about what has happened already. Maybe there were times you are told the Lord, Oh Lord, I will never backslide. I will never backslide. And you know something that happened that you hated yourself for? Something that happened and you almost felt that God will not forgive. But thank God he has forgiven you now. And now that he has forgiven you, he is now saying, as you are now converted and you are now on your feet, remember temptation will still come. Now be on your guard and watch and pray. And then when you go back home, you will see other people who have been tempted to strengthen them.
Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4. From verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. You can be tempted and not sin. Temptation is not sin. Temptation is just an enticement to do evil. If you refuse, if you reject, if you say, no, I'm not going to bow down to the devil, the strength is there. The power of the Lord is there available for you that you are not going to bow down unto the devil. It says in verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Lord is able to sustain us and is able to help us if we will pray unto him. Now, this prayer in Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Everyone needs to pray that prayer every day. Adam and Abraham, Eve and Sarah, Jacob and Esau, Moses and Aaron, Samson and Solomon, David and Bathsheba, Jehoshaphat and Ezekiah, Gideon and Gehazi, Peter and many others would have been spared many heartaches, many agonizing experiences if they had prayed this prayer sincerely and promptly. That's a warning for us that no matter how strong we may think we are, how intelligent, how spiritual, how consecrated and committed we think we are, how experienced we are in the things of the Lord, you will spare yourself many heartaches. You will spare yourself many agonizing experiences if you will pray this prayer and you will tell the Lord every day, Oh Lord, here is a new day. There will be a new temptation in the new day. But Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Temptation and, and evil are twin agents of Satan that we need protection from. The world is full of temptation and evil. Each day, each circumstance, each crossroad, in fact, even success, and every setback presents a kind of temptation and evil that we need to pray very often, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, there's a problem some people have with a passage like this. They say, but the Bible says, God does not tempt any man. How then do we have to pray that God will not lead us into temptation? Suppose we don't pray that prayer. Does that mean that God will lead us into temptation when another part of the Bible in James tells us that God tempts no man? Understand this. The word temptation in the text here in Greek is perasmus. And it means trial ordinarily. And it is sometimes translated in other parts of the Bible, test, testing, trial, or temptation. But listen to this. When there is a test, or a trial, an event, or a circumstance in our lives, God uses it as a test to prove our virtue. But Satan uses that same test, that same trial, that same event, and that same situation, he uses it as a temptation to destroy our virtue. God allows that event to prove our virtue. Satan wants through that same event 
to destroy our virtue. So, looking at that word, God will see it as a test, just an event, just a trial to prove your virtue. But looking at that same effect, Satan sees it as an opportunity to use it to destroy your virtue. The petition in the prayer then is, Lord, if you can spare us the trial, please do it. If you can spare us from that event, that crossroad, that situation, that circumstance, that Satan may use, although it's an, it's an event just by itself, if you can spare us the trial and the event, please do it. But if we have to go into that trial, which Satan will try to use, then deliver us from the evil potential that is there in that event. That is, Lord, please don't lead us into, don't permit the trial, which will present such a temptation that we will not be able to resist it. Please don't permit us to be led into a situation, circumstance, or trial which becomes an irresistible temptation that we cannot handle. This prayer then is based on the self-distrust that a child of the kingdom realizes. You see a child of the kingdom, he realizes he does not trust himself. He knows that the Lord has said that we cannot handle the devil by ourselves or handle temptation by ourselves. It is because of that self-distrust that a child of the kingdom now realizes that he lives in a fallen world which pounds against him with temptation of great strength, which he can never resist in his own humanness. It is the most natural appeal then of human weakness when he faces danger to say, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This prayer, for this prayer to be answered, we must watch and pray, lest we enter into temptation. We must submit ourselves to the Lord and resist the devil, as well as put on the whole armor of God. We go to point number two. Deliver us from evil. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Great prayer. Evil. When you think about evil, evil surrounds every one of us. Because there is evil in the world. There is evil in the hearts of men. There is evil in human nature. There is evil in the desire for success and wealth. There is evil in the tongue of man. There is evil in each day. And we live in an evil generation. Evil everywhere. So the Lord says... Although you may not see it, it's everywhere. Therefore, you have to pray. Deliver us from evil. Look at John 17, verse 15. John 17, 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. There is evil in the world. Evil in the world. The world in which we live is an evil world. And we need to be delivered from the evil. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. God gave, he who gave himself for our sins. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. The world is evil. Not only that, the hearts of men. Evil. The hearts of men. And it is from the hearts of men they will plan the evil. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Deliver us from that evil. 
the evil heart of unbelief to depart that will depart from the Lord. And the evil also is in the human nature. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If ye then being evil. It's talking about the whole of humanity. And it says, if ye then in your nature being evil. Then there is evil in the inordinate desire. Uncontrolled desire to have success, riches, or wealth. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. That great, uncontrollable, inordinate, consuming passion and desire to have wealth, riches at all costs. Look at it from verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see how you are surrounded with evil? Then we're told that there is evil even in the tongue of man. In James chapter 3, James chapter 3, from verse 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on the fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed, and has been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. We're surrounded by hundreds and thousands of tongues. And if you happen to be a pastor, the more you are known, the more people talk about you. And some of the things they say can have such great evil potential in them that if you didn't pray this prayer to be delivered from the evil in the tongues of the thousands of people that are talking against you and against your ministry, you could be finished in one week. But if you pray this prayer, understanding that the world itself the hearts of men, the tongues of men, and your own desire, the desire to even succeed, and the desire to even have a big church, even that desire, if it becomes an inordinate affection for number, and it is not just for the glory of God alone, if it becomes a desire to have a large church, so that I can say I've done better, I've done more than so and so, it can be an evil in itself. Evil within, evil without. Evil around, even evil with men and women, evil in the world. You are surrounded by evil. In fact, every day, every day has its portion and share of evil. In Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Don't add to it. It's enough. There's so much evil in every day that without your trying to add to it, you only have just enough grace to be able to overcome that one that is there already. And it's an evil generation we're living in. That's Matthew chapter 12 and verse 39. So that's the reason it is so very necessary to pray this prayer. Deliver us from evil. For this prayer to be answered, that is for God to deliver us from evil, there are some things we need to understand and do. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 7, just write it down. We must depart from evil. We, even ourselves, deliberately, with our knowledge and understanding, and we see that that is evil there, we depart from evil. Proverbs 3, verse 7. 
then we abhor that which is evil. We hate that which is evil. We turn away from that which is evil. We stamp it under our feet. We hate evil and hate it with perfect hatred. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Abhor that which is evil. We abstain from every appearance of evil. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. And then we speak evil of no man. We speak evil of no man. You can't be playing with evil if you want him to deliver you from evil. You can't be rejoicing in evil if you want him to deliver you from evil. Speak evil of no man. Titus chapter 3 verse 2. In Romans chapter 12 verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. You want the Lord to deliver you from evil? Don't perpetrate it. Recompense to no man evil for evil. In 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 10, refrain your tongue from evil. Refrain your tongue from evil. Then can you sincerely pray this prayer, deliver us from evil. Don't you know the promise of God? Look at this, Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 21. Proverbs chapter 12. Verse 21, there shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. The promise of the Lord is that there shall no evil happen to the righteous or to the just. Therefore, we can boldly and confidently pray, deliver us from evil. Now, when we say deliver us from evil, it also means something else. It means, O oh Lord, if you cannot, or if you will not, for one reason or the other, restrain the world and the men and the tongues all around me, if you cannot restrain them completely to totally stop doing evil, oh Lord, this is my prayer. Bring good out of the evil that the worldly people may try to do against me. That Lord, you have told me to pray, Deliver us from evil. And I know you can deliver me, but should in case your wisdom will allow what your power could restrain. In your wisdom, you allow it. Even though your power could have restrained it and removed it, but you have allowed it. Help me, Lord, to see why you allowed it so that you will bring good out of the evil. Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. And in verse 20, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. That's Joseph speaking to us a word of testimony. He looked at all his life. And he saw the dreams that he had. You remember those dreams? When the sun and the moon and the stars bowed down unto him. And when the ships in the field, when they bowed down to him. And it's in his childlike, simple understanding of love, he went to share with his brethren. He thought they would be happy of such a wonderful dream. But then they said, ah, so God is going to bless you more than us, prosper you more than us. Uh, do you mean that what God is revealing to you is that you will be so great, will come to bow down to you? All right. Then they began to plan evil. Lord, deliver us from evil. Even from people of our own family, the same parents, the same parents, I'm talking physical now, natural parents, that even the people may not be so happy and they may want to plan evil. And so they said, here comes the dreamer. Let us kill him. That's evil. And then we'll see what will become of his dream. One of them said, he said, our blood, don't let us kill him. Throw him to that pit. Eventually the Ishmaelites were coming. And then they sold him into slavery. You know the story. And then they put the clothes of many colors in blood. And then they took it to Jacob, their father. They said, this is what we saw. Look at it very well. If this belongs to your child, Joseph, 
and he saw it all, he said, that child is killed. That child is, is gone. And then he was so sorrowful, they comforted him, he will not be comforted. You know the story? He went to Potiphar's house. And he was still serving God. Evil came again. Didn't I tell you there's evil in the world? Even when you are righteous, even when you are following the Lord, there is evil in the world. And this woman said, come and commit sin. Oh, he said, no. Although my father is not here who taught me the word of God, although my brethren are not here, although I'm alone here, I am going to be faithful. Ah, you are going to be faithful. You'll suffer for it. That's evil. And then he held his clothes. She held his clothes and said, you must do it. And then he left his clothes and ran away. When the husband came, he said, look at this Hebrew slave that you brought here. He wanted to come and defile me. And I, the righteous woman, your faithful wife, I cried, saying, come and deliver me from this boy. When they wanted to come and deliver me then, he ran away, but I seized his clothes. And this is the evidence that he wanted to commit sin. They didn't interview the young man. They said, what? They threw him into prison. That's evil. And then in the prison there, he knew and deliver us from evil. If God has permitted an evil thing to happen, which he could have restrained in his power, he wants to bring good out of it. Look at your life. All things work together for good. For them that love God, and for them that are the called of God, and eventually, Pharaoh had a dream. The dreamer is around. And then they couldn't interpret. And then one of the servants said, I remember my fault today. When we were in the prison, there was a young man there. He interpreted the dream for me, and exactly what he said came to pass. Go and bring him. Then they brought him. And Joseph said, Interpretation is with the Lord. Amen. And then he interpreted the dream. And Pharaoh said, can we find anybody that has the spirit of God more than this one? And made him second in command. And then he was there. And then there was no newspaper, there was no radio, there was no television, but God sent information to his brethren so that he will bring good out of evil. And eventually they came. He recognized them, but he couldn't recognize him. They thought he had died. They thought or oh, he would just be a perpetual slave. And he was talking to them by an interpreter. And then when they were speaking to him, he said, you are spies. You are not genuine people. You came here to spy and to see the emptiness of the land. They said, no, we'll be 12. Ah, but you are 10 here. They said, there is one at home. He said, that's only 11. And then they said, one is not. Ah, that one that is not, you will meet him. And eventually, you know, eventually they came back the second time. You know the story. And eventually he said, all Egyptians go out. Let me reveal the goodness of the Lord. Let me show these people that God is able to bring good out of evil. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother. Does my father yet live? They were trembling. They didn't know what they will do. They thought he will do evil and destroy them. He said, no, don't worry about that. God sent me here before you to preserve your life. You meant it for evil, but God has brought good out of evil. You know, when we pray this prayer, what we're saying is that this, our lives, is in the hand of the Almighty God. The people of the world may plan evil against you, but God can bring good out of all the evil that all the people can plan. Why? Because, point number three, of the preeminence of God. Because God is able to do all things anywhere, anytime. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. This is a fitting climax for an incredible prayer. Note the connecting word in the middle of that verse 4. It says, do this, do this, do this, because for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. God's omnipotence is the reason and the measure of our unwavering expectation in prayer. The reason why we pray 
and we believe and we are confident that God will answer is that God is an omnipotent God. We are telling him, we are saying, give us this day our daily bread. We are telling him, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are telling him, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we tell him, the reason we have the confidence we are going to answer is because we know thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, not only for a temporary space of time, even forever. The end of the prayer, I want you to notice, corresponds with the beginning. Thy kingdom come at the beginning, at the end, thine is the kingdom. At the beginning, thy will be done. Why? At the end, thine is the power, supreme, irresistible power that nobody can resist. That answers to the beginning, thy will be done. And then it says, hallowed be thy name. Why? Because thine is the glory, ultimate glory, so compelling that all will eventually see and reverence the name of God. This is the God we pray to, eternal in existence, infinite in power, glorious in holiness, unlimited in love, omnipotent and omnipresent, he answers prayer. He is faithful and just. He is merciful and benevolent. He cares and he loves. His promises cover every area of life and ministry. We can expect answer when we pray because we are praying to a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according